welcome to our Market Outlook webcast. I'm Suma Nair, Chief Fiduciary Officer at Fiduciary Trust. I hope you and your family are doing well. In today's webcast, Fiduciary Trust Chief Investment Officer Hans Olsen will present our latest views on the economy and financial markets. He will be joined by our President and CEO, Austin Shepard, and they will discuss some specific questions on the minds of some of our clients. Over to you, Austin, to begin today's discussion. Thank you, Suma, and welcome to our third quarter Market Outlook. Uh, we're in the midst of the summer with a lot that has transpired and a lot to come up. We're joined today, as always, with our Chief Investment Officer, Hans Olson. Hans, are you there? I am, Austin. Good to see you. Hans, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and perspectives, and I think we'll pursue the path that we've done before with you walking through a few slides and commentary and then joining at the end uh, with some questions. So let me turn it over to you, Hans. Thank you, Austin. In the third quarter market outlook, we asked the question, has the market gone off script or has it simply lost the plot? If it's the former, that's okay. It happens at times. If it's the latter, uh, that's going to be very worrisome. And so today we want to walk through this dynamic between the market and the economies to get a sense of what the landscape looks like ahead. But first, as always, we look at what happened during the quarter. And markets were broadly higher uh, during the second quarter. Equity markets, global equities, were up roughly uh, 6% uh, during the quarter. Global equities, ex-US, was up about 2.5%. And the U.S. market, as measured by the S&P 500, was up uh, a very strong 9%. These were building on returns in the first quarter so that the year-to-date year returns, the returns as the end of June, were up on the order of 14% for global equities, 10.5% for global equities x the U.S., and then roughly 16% uh, for the U.S. market as measured uh, by the S&P 500. So very strong returns in the first half of the year. There's a dichotomy between the economic backdrop and markets. When we look at rising interest rates, an inverted yield curve, um, tightening loan standards, uh, falling business surveys, these are all reasons for concern. A closer look reveals that across um, loan standards, uh, the credit conditions are tightening. These surveys done by the Federal Reserve are, are, are all pointing to trouble within the um, uh, credit creation complex. Furthermore, a yield curve that's been now durably inverted for some time suggests that we should be worried about the economic uh, outlook. The three-month to 10-year portion of the yield curve has been inverted for roughly eight months now. Historically, 11 months of inversion uh, presage a, a downturn in economic activity. And then the uh, PMI surveys, these are the surveys conducted by the Purchasing Managers Institute, suggest that both the services side of the economy is at risk of falling into contraction and already in contraction is the manufacturing side of the economy. There is one bright spot in the economy, one very notable bright spot, and that is employment. Employment has remained remarkably robust. Indeed, averaging uh, 314,000 jobs per month uh, in the first five months of this year. And indeed, all of the, of the jobs lost during the pandemic have been recovered, and another 3.7 million jobs have been added to the economy. There are, by some accounts, roughly 4 million workers absent or missing from the labor force. And it's this, these missing um, workers that has caused such a shortage of employment and given, indeed, a great deal of bargaining power to labor uh, in this recovery. And so as long as and until there's been a weakening, there's a weakening in the, um, um, the employment situation, recession is going to be um, a concern for another day. Now, the dichotomy that we see uh, that exists between the market uh, and the, the, the economy also exists inside the market as well. Indeed, when we look at the S&P 500 um, as it's popularly uh, examined, which is a, on a market cap weighted basis, it was up about 8% during the quarter. Again, about 16% for the year. 
But if we look at that same index, that same collection of stocks from a different perspective, from an equal weighted basis, um, those stocks are up about 3.5% for the quarter and only 6% for the year. In other words, the average stock is signaling a level of concern that, these, that the overall market index in its market cap weighted form uh, does not. So it is this top heavy market that we're now seeing uh, that is really distorting uh, the returns that we see in markets. We have never seen the S&P 500 over the last 20 years be this concentrated. And indeed, um, it's this concentration, um, regardless of how you cut it, the top five stocks in the S&P 500, also euphemistically known as the Fab Five, account for 22% of the index. The Magnificent Seven, or the top seven, account for 26%. These handful of companies have, uh, are sporting market valuations or, 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 or valuations that are exceptionally high. In some cases, multiples on earnings uh, are over 150%. And in, in some cases, the uh, multiples to sales are, are over 20. So these are pretty princely valuations on a very handful of companies. Now, it's hard to build diversified portfolios when you are benchmarking against such concentrated indices. Now, the rally this year appears to be in part due to investors looking through any recession that might materialize to the inevitable recovery that follows. But there's a problem with this type of thinking, and that is that markets very, very rarely, and indeed, we could not find an instance uh, looking at 100 years worth of data where the market bottomed before the onset of recession. Markets always bottom during uh, a recessionary event, not before. And the only instance where we found uh, the, the market didn't bottom, in fact, didn't react at all, was uh, coming out of the Second World War, where there was certainly more going on than simply, simply the, the elements of a business cycle at play. So where does this lead us all going forward? Well, tightening credit conditions and an inverted yield curve have historically resulted in recession. And indeed, we're getting reports from private asset managers that these tightening credit conditions are manifesting themselves in the lending between banks uh, and uh, companies that are involved with some sort of transaction. Reports that we've had even recently uh, with funds that we're invested in have confirmed this willingness or this lack of willingness, excuse me, on the part of banks to consummate uh, underwritings that uh, were earlier engaged in. Now, this has given um, our funds the opportunity uh, to make more uh, attractive investments, but concerningly, it's, it's confirming these larger uh, reports that we're getting out of the Federal Reserve that banks are indeed um, tightening their lending, lending standards and their willingness to lend is falling, falling which is problematic. So what this means for markets as we go through the second half of the year is that things are likely going to slow down um, on, on the economic front, but also in the equity markets. It's hard to see how the very strong run, the double-digit runs of the first half are re repeated in the second half. And indeed, the hope is that those gains can be held rather than relinquished as more of the economic uh, issues um, make themselves manifest. Going, uh, expanding our lens internationally, a weaker dollar, which we expect will remain so as international interest rates rise uh, in concert with American interest rates, that should help weaken the dollar, which will make international markets much more attractive than they have been uh, heretofore. And indeed, it, international markets have been remarkably strong this year as the dollar weakened. Um, the European markets are up uh, double digits, uh, very similar to the American markets. And Japan has been a sleeper market, uh, a sleeper surprise this year, advancing in double digits as well, both in um, local currency terms and in dollar terms. So we think that, that uh, as, as these trends tend to exert themselves, it'll be the international markets that might hold more allure than the domestic markets. So as we come in, as we enter the second half of the year, this question of, of whether the market has lost the plot or not is going to remain firmly uh, at the forefront of our thinking. I think it's also important to, to realize that um, 
you know, when we're thinking about these euphemisms for the handful of stocks, whether it be the Fab Five or the Magnificent Seven. In the case of the Magnificent Seven, for those who are cinematic buffs, they'll recall that um, most of the uh, uh, of the the folks in that film ended up dying. So it's a, a bit of the plot that should not be lost as we work through the second half of this year. Thank you, Hans. And as we do uh, in these presentations, uh, we have a few follow-on questions. Um, and so let me start with one uh, particular question following on the discussion around the concentration in the U.S. equity markets around this magnificent seven uh, that have really been the primary drivers of the, the market, uh, market cap uh, change. Hans, I'd love to hear your thoughts and perspectives as it relates to, um, is it sustainable? Is it sustainable to have such a small number of stocks that are really driving the overarching market where out of the S&P 500, 493 other stocks uh, may be having a very different path? And uh, your thoughts about sustainability and also characteristics about these that hold them together. Why, why these seven? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the central point, Austin. You know, the Magnificent Seven. Um, if there's a light motif, or, or or maybe two motifs running through that that handful, uh, roughly two handfuls of stocks, uh, would be one. Um, they represent some sort of new version of the economy, and secondly, uh, they represented. Um, interestingly enough, defensive growth because these companies had put up. Um, pretty good growth. Uh, but the question really is, is it durable growth? Um, because already with some of these companies, we've seen some material threats to those growth patterns. And Austin, it's growth at very, very princely prices. I guess it's the other question that, that I think you've, you've tackled in past is, if I was to come to you straight off and I say, I'd like you to invest, uh, what is it, 20% of my portfolio in seven names that are uh, multiples that are at a premium to everything else, that might be a risky pr uh, trade to make. You'd wonder, I mean, if, if the answer was yes, you'd wonder if, if I had lost the plot, um, for sure. I mean, it's because, it, it, you know, you're, when you have, re, uh, when you look at um, mar markets such as the S&P 500, so market cap weighted index, which means that um, you know, if you take your earnings and you multiply it times your multiple, that gives you your market cap, right? And when you look at these handful of companies, they're all sporting you know, multiples that are far above uh, big premiums to the overall market. So ultimately, the question remains, you know, how do you justify those multiples? Is it through further growth? Right? How do you maintain your position? Is it through further growth of earnings, um, or or do you get more multiple expansion? One would argue that getting more multiple expansion is going to be very very difficult, and keeping that earnings growth already right, as we've we've talked about is going to be a very hard job indeed. No, it's a, it's a good point, and also sort of underlines I think a, a broader perspective around diversification uh, and the benefit. Hans, there's another topic I wanted to touch on that you mentioned around the inverted yield curve, right? And we've talked about in the past that the yield curve is just a representation of what uh, interest you might get on a bond, in, you know, in six months in a year versus 10 years out, right? Um, and currently we have the situation where it's inverted, where the the nearer, the closer the time horizon, a higher rate than farther out, which is atypical. Um, uh, there are only two ways. If we believe that over long term that this will go back to a normal uh, relationship, there are possibly two ways of solving that. One is that the longer term interest rates would rise, or second option would be that the near term interest rates fall. And what's your thought on that? Yeah, neither are really good outcomes, right, for for the resolution of a of an inverted yield curve. So for as you said, if for the for the shorter end to come down, essentially the Federal Reserve would have to cut interest rates, and um, and then eventually it will. But typically, the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates when the economy is falling into a recession, which is not at this point. Um, but as we said, the conditions seem to be there that make recession, you know, a rising probability. But 
the only way that goes down is that the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates. For the long end of the curve to go up, right? So for, for those prices to fall and those yields to rise, which reestablishes the, the normal relationship, there has to be some sort of buyer strike, right? Where they demand a higher yield and therefore are willing to pay a lower price in order to, to take that debt. And uh, that could be a very painful outcome as well. Now, if you were to, uh, um, you know, force me to handicap which one is going to happen first, I'd have to say that the Fed cutting interest rates rather than a buyer strike happening. Although a buyer strike would represent a return of the bond vigilante, a group, you know, a fractious group of investors that have been firmly asleep for the last 30 years. Um, but uh, uh, I think it's probably going to come through the Fed cutting interest rates, not because they want to, but eventually because they have to. And based on your comments, would that in, would, should I interpret it that this inversion, more likely than not, will actually take some time to get back into a normal, it will take much more than just you know, a few months, but it could be in an inverted stance for some time. For some time, indeed. We're at eight months right now. 11 has historically been the average before an economy uh, slips into recession. Because we have these labor market issues, right? We're missing roughly 4 million people in the labor force. It remains terribly out of whack. A shortage of workers uh, continues to persist. That's going to keep um, the pressures on inflation, which is why the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates to begin with, high. And so the Fed's ability to actually cut interest rates, if they are to be serious about arresting inflation, is limited. And uh, interestingly enough, it is a recession that typically is the thing that really does um, bring to heel inflation, because as demand falls, so does uh, uh, you know the, the the pressure on prices. And the, the system starts to turn, um, you know, through the cycle once again. So I, I do think that we won't see uh, lower interest rates in the short end of the curve um, any time this year. Um, and, and by every by every account, that the central bank rem remains, you know, incredibly focused and concerned about the stickiness of prices. Um, so we'll start. We'll see this collection of data, which I think suggests that. Hey, there are there's legitimate concerns about the health of the economy on the horizon, conflicting uh, with with the um, the the price data, the inflation data. Eventually, they'll collide in a way that we'll see recession probably occur at some point within the next twelve months, and with that, um, we'll start to see interest rates coming down, and then uh, that normal upward sloping yield curve. Uh, reassert itself. Now, of course, along that way, there's going to be a fair amount of dislocation. So a 16% run that we've seen in the market this year, well, that could be at risk, right? Holding those gains could be could be at risk, most likely are at risk. Well, Hans, on that note, uh, why don't we conclude? Because I, I think you've laid out uh, quite a play or a story here for us to observe and participate in over at least the next six months, uh, and particularly we'll get together in three months to see how it's uh, playing out. So thank you very much, Hans, uh, and thank you uh, all for joining us uh, for our market outlook. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we look forward to reconvening again uh, at the end of this upcoming quarter, and as, as has been the case, I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about. So again, thank you. I'd also like to express appreciation to our audience for joining us. We hope that you found the discussion useful. We are experiencing an uncertain time in the economy and markets. At Fiduciary Trust, we have extensive wealth planning, investment, trust, tax, and other expertise to help our clients navigate through it and achieve their goals. I encourage you to access some of our knowledge through insights on our website at fidtrustco.com, as well as by reaching out to your Fiduciary Trust officer or to Rick Tyson at 617-292-6799 or at Tyson at fiduciary-trust.com. Thanks again for joining us. The opinions expressed in this material are as of the date issued and subject to change at any time. They discuss general market conditions and trends and should not be construed as investment advice. Any reference to specific securities are for illustrative purposes only 
and are not intended to be and should not be interpreted as recommendations to purchase or sell such securities. Nothing contained herein is intended to constitute investment, legal, tax, or accounting advice, and you should discuss any proposed arrangement or transaction with your investment, legal, or tax advisor. Copyright Fiduciary Trust Company.